imprisoned for over two decades, fought to prove his innocence for over 30 years, only to die of colon cancer just two years after clearing his name. This is the story of a man named Aaron Walsh. We will start by discussing the crime that occurred. On August 11th, 1975, Aaron and his friend George arrived in St. John, New Brunswick with the intention of selling about two and a half kilograms of crystal meth they had bought in Montreal. He was also carrying about $800. That same night, they went out drinking and met two locals named Donald McMillan and David Walton. Aaron expressed to Donald McMillan that he was interested in buying a gun. The men drove to a farmhouse where they offered Aaron a sawed-off shotgun. He refused, saying he wanted a pistol instead. The next morning, the morning of August 12, 1975, George and Aaron met up with the two men from the night before, Donald and David. They discussed their plans to sell the meth they had brought from Montreal and were soon joined by a man named Melvin Cheche Peters. Their drinking continued through the morning. The five of them then decided to drive to Tin Can Beach on the south end of town. Their drinking continued on the beach. Aaron decided to wade in the water. Aaron looked up from the water to see that the trunk of his brown Cadillac was open and Melvin, Donald, and David were standing around it. He checked his pockets for his keys and then headed back toward the beach. He suspected the other men were trying to steal his drugs and his money. Once Aaron made it out of the water and onto the beach, he confronted the three men, but they attacked him and threatened him with a shotgun. They demanded Aaron tell them where he had kept the drugs and the money. He complied and told them where they were. By this point, he feared for his life and made a break for it. He ran up a nearby embankment to where a seven-man team of Canadian National Railway workers were standing, and he asked them to call the police. Aaron then attempted to run back to his car to escape. On his way back to the car, however, he was forced into the front seat at gunpoint between Donald and David. Melvin was in the back seat. A conversation ensued regarding what Aaron's fate would be. Donald said they had to get rid of him somehow, and Melvin said they should just blow his head off. Melvin initially held the gun, but Aaron, terrified for what they would do to him and knowing his life was in danger, reached for it, causing a struggle between all the men in the car. A shot was fired. <laughs> Melvin, who was sitting in the back seat, was shot in the chest. Aaron denied firing the shot and believed that the gun ended up in the hands of Donald McMillan. Law enforcement arrived on the scene. Melvin got himself out of the back seat of the Cadillac and stumbled over to the police cruiser. He opened the door and fell in. The remaining men in the car, George Ferguson, Donald McMillan, David Walton, and Aaron Walsh were all arrested. Melvin was rushed to the hospital, but sadly, his injuries were too severe and he passed away. Aaron was charged for Melvin's murder later that day. We will now discuss the details of Aaron Walsh's murder trial. Aaron faced a trial by jury. The prosecution's account of the crime will now be explained in regards to the events preceding the murder, the murder itself, the murder weapon, and the motive. The Crown called Donald McMillan and David Walton as witnesses to testify against Aaron. Their version of events was quite different from Aaron's. In regards to the events that led to the murder, the men claimed that the morning of August 12, 1975, on Tin Can Beach, the five men had been drinking together. Donald and David claimed they had not assaulted Aaron whatsoever on the beach that day. They claimed that Aaron was the true aggressor. 
they testified that he had been making racist comments to Melvin Peters, who is African-Canadian. As for the murder itself, Donald and David gave a very simplistic account of the event. Donald and David testified that Melvin was sitting in the back seat of Aaron's Cadillac, and when they both returned to the car from the beach, Aaron reached under the front seat, pulled out the shotgun, and shot Melvin, who was simply sitting there and minding his own business. In regards to the weapon used to murder Melvin, a sawed-off shotgun, Donald and David testified that both a firearm and the ammunition belonged to Aaron, who had purchased them while he was in St. John. In terms of motive, both Donald and David testified that it was a hatred for black people that caused Aaron to shoot Melvin. This was supported by their earlier claims that he was making racist remarks towards Melvin on Tin Can Beach that morning of the 12th. Aaron's defense against this murder accusation was a terribly weak one. He had no evidence to support his claim of innocence aside from his word, and his word, when stacked against that of Donald and David, and for other reasons we will touch on later, was not convincing to a jury. This leads us to the verdict of Aaron Walsh's murder trial. As was previously mentioned, Aaron faced a trial by jury. And on October 17, 1975, this jury, after just one hour of deliberation, during which they even took a break to eat lunch, found Aaron Walsh guilty of second-degree murder. For the murder of Melvin Peters on August 12, 1975, in St. John, New Brunswick, Aaron Walsh was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 10 years, the minimum sentence for a second-degree murder conviction in Canada. We will now discuss the aftermath of Aaron Walsh's conviction and sentencing and the subsequent appeals he made. Aaron Walsh spent 10 years behind bars, after which he was released on parole. However, due to multiple parole violations resulting in incarceration, he spent about 28 years of his life in prison. His first appeal to the New Brunswick Court of Appeal was denied. He was undeterred, however. He kept writing letters to officials and got information from whoever he could, even when it worked against him in the eyes of the parole board. Aaron finally broke ground in 2003, he wrote a letter to the New Brunswick Provincial Archives and obtained a copy of the Crown's complete case file against him. The contents of this case file would later serve to acquit him. Aaron filed an application to the Federal Minister of Justice to review his conviction under Section 696.1 of the Criminal Code of Canada. He did this on the grounds that the new information he uncovered in the Crown's case file would prove his innocence. Tragically, Aaron was diagnosed with terminal cancer just a short time after submitting his application. His application process was expedited due to this, and it was approved in February of 2008. And finally, in March 2008, the New Brunswick Court of Appeal acquitted Aaron Walsh of the murder of Melvin Peters. Sadly, just two years after clearing his name, Aaron Walsh passed away at the age of 62. Aaron's story is an overwhelmingly sad and horrible one. It is for this reason that it's important that we explore the reasons why this tragedy occurred. As was previously mentioned, in the Crown's case file, which he obtained from the Provincial Archives, he uncovered information that later helped acquit him. We will discuss those now. Upon looking through the Crown's case file, Aaron found record of a conversation between Donald and David that the Crown never disclosed to him or his defense team and which called into question the credibility of Donald and David's testimony. After their arrest on August 12, 1975, Donald and David spoke to each other in their cells about what had occurred. Police overheard the conversation. In a shocking display of straightforwardness, David asks Donald, what did you shoot Che Che for? To which Donald responds saying, you're going to help me out, aren't you, Dave? The two then continued with a conversation, creating a story that would shift the blame away from them. 
A second piece of information that cast doubt on the testimony of Donald and David was an interview with an employee from the hardware store where Aaron supposedly purchased the ammunition which he would use to purportedly kill Melvin with. The interview revealed that the ammunition had been bought one day before Aaron had even arrived in St. John. He was miles away. This directly implied Donald. The third piece of information found were seven signed statements from the Canadian National Railroad employees who Aaron had run up to from the beach to ask for help. These signed statements directly contradict what Donald reported had happened. The final piece of information which Aaron uncovered was a ballistics report that had gone undisclosed. If he had had this ballistics report, he would have been able to ask the ballistics expert more appropriate questions. It is painstakingly clear that there was misconduct at almost every level of the criminal justice system in the case of Aaron Walsh. From here, we can identify the reasons for Aaron Walsh's wrongful conviction. The first and most obvious is the lack of disclosure of important information on the part of the Crown. The information the Crown withheld in the case of Aaron Walsh directly implied the culpability of someone other than Aaron. The Supreme Court established Crown disclosure as a legal obligation in the Stingcomb case. The Crown has a distinct duty to provide disclosure to the accused, and this duty becomes particularly important if the information will benefit the accused and if withholding it will impair their rights. The lack of disclosure in the Aaron Walsh case robbed him of the possibility of having a fair trial. Another potential reason for Aaron Walsh's wrongful conviction is that he was a relatively unlikable defendant. He already had a fairly lengthy criminal record. One report described him as a vagabond scofflaw who sold hard drugs, drank liquor in excess, and got himself in and out of trouble. An incident he was involved in shortly before his trial only served to solidify this reputation. He held his lawyer and a few correctional officers hostage for a couple hours before releasing them. A defendant like Aaron Walsh would not be favorable in the eyes of the jury. The third factor contributing to this wrongful conviction is perjured testimony on the part of Donald and David. Donald McMillan blatantly lied about Aaron having bought the ammunition, as was proven by the interview with the hardware store employee. The signed statements from the railroad employees suggest that both Donald and David lied about the events leading up to the murder. Some consider the Crown's accusation of racism on the part of Aaron to be faulty given the fact that he grew up in Mulgrave Park, one of the most racially diverse areas in Canada, not to suggest that living in a diverse area prevents you from being racist, but the fact that this information came from two witnesses who fabricated other information about Aaron suggests that this may be as well, and it may be an act of perjury. The fourth possible reason for this wrongful conviction, and perhaps a better reason for why it wasn't rectified sooner, is Aaron's continued insistence on his innocence. Despite having few resources and hardly any money, he kept trying to prove his innocence, and even when his appeals got denied, he persisted. His frequent letter writing to officials is what eventually helped him prove his innocence. Looking at his high number of parole violations and resulting incarcerations may suggest that this insistence came at a price. He may have been viewed by law enforcement as not taking responsibility for his actions. This may have made them less likely to help him, and it may have even slowed the wheels of justice from turning. A fifth and final reason for this wrongful conviction is the criminal justice landscape of the 1970s. The 70s saw an increase in violent crime, including homicide, which peaked in 1991. This may have triggered law enforcement officials to adopt a tough-on-crime approach to address the societal issue of a rise in violent crime. This could mean there is an increased pressure on prosecutors to convict, especially for a crime like homicide. Prosecutorial misconduct, as was seen in the Aaron Walsh case, may be more likely if it guarantees a conviction. Aaron Walsh was yet another victim of an often flawed criminal justice system. Knowing that such major exculpatory evidence was right under the nose of police and prosecutors for over two decades is a very harrowing thought. As is the case with every wrongful conviction, 
the best course of action is to learn from our mistakes and make adjustments in the system. I'd like to thank you for watching and for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this video.